Coming up on Need to Know, recipes, movie trailers, the stock market, sports scores. It seems that anything you could possibly want to learn about is available at your fingertips through the internet. But is there a price to pay for the consumption of all this information? We'll find out. Also on the show, it's being referred to as one of the biggest music industry comebacks in recent years. But according to one local music figure, it never lost its home in Rochester. The vinyl record renaissance just ahead. And a quartet founded in Rochester dares to take on 16 special works created by none other than Beethoven. Exploring the human experience through two violins, a viola, and a cello. It's all coming up right now on Need to Know. You can access information to virtually any question you could ask, inquiring thought you might have, or subject that strikes your fancy, all on the internet. There's a world of discovery on your smartphone, smart TV, laptop, or other digital media device. You can check your emails, post on social media, watch videos, shop, and play your fantasy football leagues via the web. But is all this digital FaceTime really an attraction or a distraction? Does this access to information serve as an asset or a disservice to our daily lives? And with some researchers calling this a digital addiction, how is this really impacting learning, memory, and the brain? Joining me for this conversation is Ron Friedman. He's an award-winning social psychologist and also a behavior change expert, the CEO of the Friedman Strategy Group, and the author of the book, The Best Place to Work. And it's great to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. So it seems, Ron, I have been reading more books and, and newspaper articles, magazine publications about what some experts, some doctors have referred to as this addiction of sorts. And it's not only to technology, but the information provided through various sources of, of technology. And some viewers, they may be watching and ask, well, what's so bad about being interested in, in getting information on the web? So how would, how would you respond to that? Well, we live at a time when we have more information available to us than ever before in the history of mankind. Yeah. Uh, we have more books that have been published. We have access to a limitless amount of podcasts, uh, radio programs, TV programs. Programs and all that information is fantastic. We have more information that we can use, and it's never been easier to acquire knowledge. However, all that information also comes with a cost. So, the more information that's coming at you, the more decisions you have to make about whether or not to pay attention. And making those decisions is cognitively expensive. So, the more decisions we make, the harder time we have focusing on what actually matters. And it seems, you know, this this pursuit. Of information, I'm curious actually. How did this pursuit of information, in particular, all the things you mentioned, which we can access, you know, online, was there? Is there a point in time we can say this really took off, or, or why is it that we're hearing about this more? Well, you know, we are surrounded by devices that make everything feel. Uh, urgent and important and so we've got the ding of our email inboxes we've got the buzz of our cell phones we've got uh, the visual clatter of pop-up messages coming right at us all the time and so when we're surrounded by information that piques our curiosity um, it becomes uh, really difficult to concentrate and so you know if you go online right now uh, chances are you're going to be bombarded with all these headlines that seem kind of interesting are they relevant to you I'm not so sure so for example uh, you'll never guess what this coworker did did to, to make her colleagues smile. Is that information you really need? Probably not, but yet you're attracted to it. You want to find out, you want to satisfy that curiosity, and neurologically what's happening uh, when you satisfy some curiosity is that you your brain releases dopamine. That activates the reward center of the brain. So that information is pleasurable for you. Not necessarily valuable, but pleasurable. And so it's much more difficult to focus, and that's a real problem, especially in the world of work. And so with that dopamine, that's where the whole, some people are referring to, this has become an addiction. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the programmers, the people who design yeah. these uh, cell phones and these programs, they value your 
attention because the more attention they are able to attract, the more advertisements they can sell. And so that, that's why they're designing these programs and these uh, devices in a way that leads you to pay more attention to them. That's not necessarily in your interest. And so the critical thing that we all need to be more aware of is whether or not we're choosing to pay attention to the things that matter or we're letting these devices control us and our behaviors. Well, one point that you made, uh, you mentioned work and the effect that this can have on work. And uh, a recent survey finds that the average U.S. worker spends about six hours or 30 hours a week checking email. Six hours a day, I should say, or 30 hours a week. And, and I want to know, you know, email isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it's a part of work culture. It's a part of our personal lives. So, you know, what do these survey results tell us? Are they shocking at all, or is this just how life is right now? Well, they're not shocking at all. I mean, I, I think in some ways it's surprising that it's just six hours, considering <laughs> okay. that the workday has expanded right. beyond nine to five. And so probably if you were to measure how, and you can do this, there have been studies looking at how often people uh, you know, punch in their password to actually activate their phone, and it's a staggering number. It's over 100 times for the average individual. Uh, and, and it's problematic, and so I think that the, at most workplaces, what we need to recognize and really differentiate between is being current and being productive. Yeah. And so our job, in a lot of ways, has become kind of monitoring email. Is that necessarily valuable? I don't think so, and I think uh, a lot of smarter workplaces are recognizing this by creating things like no-fly zones between certain hours, and so between 10 and 1 o'clock, you're not necessarily required to respond to email uh, promptly. And so the idea is any, any task really worth doing requires focused attention. Email is the antithesis of focused attention. Right. And so if you want to get things done and actually be productive, you actually need to set some boundaries by doing things like batching email checking. So you can do that, for example, three, three, three times a day. If you were to check your email at 9 o'clock until 9.30, check it again at around lunchtime, check it again before the end of the day, I'm willing to bet you'd be not just more productive but a lot more satisfied in how much you got done. And that's something that you've, you've researched extensively. You, re you wrote that in your book, uh, The Best Place to Work. And I, I would have to imagine, uh, it's great points that you mentioned, because I can only imagine the type, how that can affect your creativity, right, on the job, and, and how being so consumed by things such as email, mm -hmm. um, A, creativity, results on the job, and then also uh, team building and collaboration that keeps you kind of isolated from your coworkers if you're so focused in on something like that. Absolutely, and I think it also is detrimental yeah. to your mood. And so the more you're checking email, the less productive you're being because you're not able to focus and that gets you frustrated. And so if we're talking about email from the perspective of, okay, we're gonna increase collaboration, it's really problematic because what's happening is people get frustrated and really the only time that they have for doing focused work is either to come in early, stay late, or work on the weekend. And that's just really problematic from an engagement standpoint. You mentioned creativity. And one of the most, uh, one of the times in which we often find that our best ideas come to us is in the shower. And the reason for that is because it's one of the few times when we're not holding our phones. And so we're allowing uh, new ideas to consolidate. We're, at, we're, allowing, um, we're, we're finding new connections that we wouldn't necessarily think of. And those moments of being completely disconnected are becoming fewer and farther between. It makes me think about mindfulness, and that's something that we've talked about on Need, Bef Need to Know in the, in, in the past. And what's interesting about that is there are, are psychologists and, and psycho, um, psychotherapists, and they say the Internet takes you out of that moment. And, and you wrote about this in an article, Why Too Much Data Disables Your Decision Making. And you wrote that the big challenge is differentiating or lies in differentiating between questions worth exploring and questions best left unasked. How do you make that distinction? It's very difficult uh, okay. because we have more and more information accessible to us. So when, we're in, when we have information that's missing, uh, that piques our curiosity. And as we mentioned, when we have information that, that piques our curiosity and we can access it, that releases dopamine. And so it creates yeah. this vicious cycle where the more information you have available to you, the more choices you have to make about whether or not to pay attention, the more choices you're making, the more mentally fatigued you become. And the more mentally fatigued you become, the more susceptible you are to more of these distractions. So we're all, all susceptible to this information and it gets worse over the course of the workday. So one of the smartest things you can do is really protect your best hours. So for most of us, we tend to be sharpest early in the morning. And so if you can protect those hours by keeping them email free for at least some of that, day, some of the, that portion of the day, you're gonna be a lot more productive and also a lot better at making smarter decisions because you're not quite as fatigued by having made all the decisions that come with checking email and being online. 
One thing I want to ask, uh, in a New York Times article in late 2015, Tim Schwartz of the Energy Project, uh, he said that the web is making it hard for people to focus and that it's it's replaced work um, as our most socially sanctioned addiction, and those are his words. So I want to know, how are we able to identify whether we are over consumers of this information with various forms of technology or if we're okay? Like, how do we know? Well, I think we need to step away from this idea of whether or not we're addicts because that yes or no uh, uh, decision kind of, it, it makes it a lot easier to say, oh, it's not me, that's somebody else. Okay. And I think we need to recognize we're all in some level susceptible to this type of addiction, at least momentarily. And so um, what I think we need to start doing and be more mindful of is w finding ways that um, make digital snacking a little bit more difficult to do. And so when you're working, what I highly recommend is to, to the extent that you can, shut off email at least for a half hour, for example. That allows you to pay attention to the work that you're doing. Put your phone in your drawer so that those distractions aren't bombarding you constantly. And work with a notepad. And the reason I mention a notepad, put a notepad on the side, maybe it could be even post-its. And the idea is every time you have an urge to check something online, write it down. And when you write it down, what that does is it allows you to move on to the next thing without feeling in the back of your, your, of your brain that you have to go back and look at, look at it. So you have that list that allows you to retain your focus, go back to what you're working on. You'll be a lot more productive. You'll also be happier and get more done. And as we wrap, I want to ask, you've mentioned this, you said, you know, the workday is much longer now than it mm -hmm. used to be. That being said, and, and the tips that you just gave, how do we transition then when we get home, right? And, and, and learn how to, to tune out as well so we can focus on our families, our friends, uh, us time. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, it's a serious issue, and it's just frankly something that I think we all struggle with, including me. And here are some things that I have found work. So one thing, and this is this is I think a tip that anybody can use, is put your phone in a different room than where you are going to be when you get home from work. So for example, if you're going to be in the kitchen cooking dinner, put your phone in your bedroom. Um, what that enables you to do is not have to resist the temptation of checking your email every time you walk by your phone. And if you're using your phone for other things, like listening to music on Spotify, whatever the case may be, you can put Spotify on your iPad, don't put your email on your iPad, put your phone in your room, and check your email. By all means, if you wanna check your email, do so. Just don't do it every 10 minutes. I also want to point out that from a workplace perspective, there are lots of tiny things that don't cost anything that organizations can do in order to allow their employees to replenish their mental energy when they get home. So for example, if you're a manager, um, resist emailing at all hours because although that might make you feel productive in the moment, it's actually costing you in terms of the engagement of your employees. If they're not able to replenish their energy, they cannot be quite as engaged as they otherwise might be. And so um, and it, one of the recommendations is uh, uh, not just uh, don't email, but rather email, but have the email program to arrive the following morning. That allows you to still get your ideas out, but also allows your employees some freedom. Ron Friedman, thank you so much for your time today. You can learn about Ron's work and research at FriedmanStrategy.com and Ignite80.com. When you hear the term vinyl records, whatever you do, don't think of them as being passe. They are anything but, according to my guest today and according to industry data over the past few years. There was a 52% growth in vinyl record album sales in 2014, while digital albums were dealt a nearly 10% decline in sales. That from Nielsen Music. Some industry reports are calling this ongoing resurgence of vinyl sales a vinyl renaissance, a return from the dead, and a comeback. But one local independent record store owner says in Rochester, vinyl has been spinning for years. Joining me for this discussion is Tom Cohn, owner of Bop Shop Records, which has been a go-to record destination for music lovers around the world for more than two decades. Welcome to the show. Great. So Tom, I have read all these articles about sure. vinyl, vinyls on the rise from the ashes and all this kind of stuff over the past two years. But you said in so many words, that's nonsense, especially when it comes to Rochester. What do you mean by that? Well, this has been a, 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 a town vibrant with you know, music for you know, decades and decades and decades. And I've been dealing and, and listening to music and collecting records since I was a kid, hence why I opened the store. And records never went away. They just sort of got hidden for a little while. Um, as the, the decline of vinyl records came into being and the CDs started dominating things, they kind of went underground for a while. And over time, in the early 2000s, they started to kind of 
the interest peaked. Artists stuck with the vinyl for quite a bit. So artists like Neil Young always had vinyl pressings. By the mid 2000s and late 2000s, it was kind of an upswing, and in the last four or five years, it's been just ridiculously yeah. unbelievable. I mean, just everything's out <laughs> yeah. on vinyl now. So why go vinyl? And, and before, prior to this segment, we were discussing the internet mm -hmm. and how virtually anything is available at your fingertips. So why not just you know download an album as opposed to the effort that it takes to to t get a record, put on a turntable, yeah. drop a needle, and that sort of thing? Well, there's a couple of reasons that that action right there, the tactile action of opening a record up, hearing the spine crack getting the record out, looking at the sleeve, looking at the art, putting it on, putting the needle on it. It's, an, it's like when you buy a new book, you want to you know, read the book. It's, it's the same thing, it's a piece of art that you can interact with. Um, sound is clearly better, I will, many will argue, but compared to MP3 downloads and a good, clean, especially new records, sound pretty amazing, most of them anyway. That's one thing so I did hear. Sound is Music industry experts have said that same thing. They, when looking at, at the vinyl, mm -hmm. they say that sound quality is the main reason for renewed interest, as right. they call it, as opposed right. to. So, do we know what happens with a digital download that just kind of that? They're compressed files, and they, they sound like listening to music with saran wrap around your head. Highs are kind of uh, muddled. You know, I don't download, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with, with, <laughs> with many download yeah. things. I've never, I, I don't download anything hardly at all, unless it's a file I need for a, a new artist that I need to hear. But in general, I always prefer vinyl at home and at the store. Um, if the music's only on CD, though, I'll buy that, because if I like the band, I'll buy their product. And it's about buying product. And um, Adele's a good example. She's has physical product and you can buy it on iTunes but you cannot stream her stuff and it the benefit is clearly in the artist's interest f with physical product well, let me ask you this I can remember as a kid my parents had a number of vinyl records they had a hu this huge uh, record player and I can remember I would want to put the record on and my parents would be like be careful you know and, and don't yeah. scratch it because with a scratch you ruin the entire thing so uh, I, I'm curious as to how do you make the case for vinyl with that in mind, the fact that you have to be so careful with the physical product. CDs scratch just as easy. And once a CD is scratched, if the, if the scratch goes through to the metal film, you might just throw it away. It, it won't play. At least worn records and scratch records will still play. Ideally, you want to play them on a re reasonably good equipment and handle them carefully. Don't put fingerprints on them because the oils will bother them. They're, they're a delicate thing. Um, but the sound is just exquisite and, and far beyond what, um, especially downloads and, and MP3 files can give you. How do you describe the sound? Because I visited your store. Warm. Warm. Yeah, warm. Uh, that's the that's the key word. There's, there's, uh, the audio files will have many words for it, but yeah. there's a warmth and a richness and a uh, vitality to it that you just don't get out of, you know, f download files. Stuff like that. Um, I'm curious. You know, we live in this this music rich community. Yeah. What role, if any, does the jazz festival, the Eastman School of Music, Hochstein, do they, do they play any type of a role in in this local? You said, you know, Rochester is known as being a go to destination for for vinyl. I've seen. I gotta tell you, I've seen a number of YouTube videos. Uh, vinyl collectors mm -hmm. say, "You've got to go to Rochester. You've got to go to Rochester." Mm -hmm. What makes this community rich in vinyl? It's it's always been an arts community, so there's always been an interest in that. So there's a lot of records from the old days kicking around. We've been a destination for music since the 20s and 30s. You know, in the in the 50s, there was a club called the Pitha that everybody in New York came up and played. Uh, it was gone by the early early 70s, I think. Uh, so there's always been people coming through and there's always been a lot of faculty and, and writers and educators here and people who are interested in all kinds of music, you know, classical, jazz, blues, rock and roll, punk, I mean, every genre you can think of is there. So, I mean, it just, it's it's a richer community. There's many like it around the country, but this just happens to be a, a plethora of uh, good good wa wax in the, the area and all through <laughs> upstate New York, actually. Well, my well. vinyl album sales, they make up, uh, only make up about 6% of total, al total album yeah. sales in the U.S. So, you know, with, with Amazon being the top vinyl record seller, I'm, I'm curious, how do independent stores like Bop Shop Records, what is it that you're, that you're doing to really keep pumping when it comes to uh, this, this niche market? 
Well, part of my, my thing's always been, uh, and, and part of the, the logo and the branding of the store is hand-selected vinyl, in which everything in the store is pr pretty much hand-selected, cleaned, priced. I, I look in everything that comes to the store. So everything I put out and deal in is, is near mint or pristine. The records sound really good when they're kept good and clean. Um, I have four online stores. We, we do ship all over the world. Um, it's basically what everybody does. And um, Amazon's been one of my best ways to sell stuff internationally. So they've, it's been a really good, I hate it when they take the percentages, but <laughs> overall it's a pretty good thing. Um, and there's a lot of records around, you know, and there's a lot of music around. Music is really the most important thing and it breathes, breathes life into this community at so many different levels and so many different places, from the small clubs to the big theaters, you know. You see it in the concerts we have, and the shows we have, and the festivals we have. It's quite astounding. So, well, Tom Cohn of Rochester's Bop Shop <laughs> Records. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Oh, thanks. And you can check out Bop Shop Records' extensive collection of vinyl records, CDs, and more at bopshop.com. We transition from the music of vinyl records to the sounds of string quartets, in particular a homegrown ensemble made up of four friends with a passion for the types of music that can be created through four stringed instruments. They're called the Amenda Quartet. They named themselves after one of Beethoven's best friends, which was certainly fitting as their work involves playing all of Beethoven's 16 quartets. The Rochester group says within the music, one finds express the spectrum of human experience. Check it out. Project Ludwig is uh, a project of the Amenda String Quartet. In fact, we formed for this project, which is to play all the Beethoven String Quartets. There are 16 of them. It's a gigantic project, and, and uh, our excitement about it was such that we have been uh, at it for almost uh, six years now. Beethoven wrote 16 string quartets, and it's, it's, some, it's, a, it's something that a lot of string quartets want to do is to be able to play all of the Beethoven string quartets. I think most, maybe all the quartets I've ever heard of that have uh, dared to take it on have been full-time string quartets. Of course, we're all professional musicians, but we all uh, make our livings through many means, orchestra and teaching and other projects, businesses even outside of the quartet. These are extremely difficult works, and most full-time quartets uh, will play almost every day, rehearse almost every day. We don't have that uh, luxury, and so uh, we have to be extremely efficient as we work. We're playing the 16 pieces over nine months between September and of this year to June of next spring, and playing about one concert every three weeks and playing all the quartets in different venues around the Rochester area. Music of Beethoven from all different periods at the same time, like we're doing today, you're learning so much about him and his development and, and, and the way that his music moves and it's different from the beginning to the end. We would like to play Beethoven because, at least for me, because he expresses all aspects of the human experience. From exuberant joy and hopefulness to tragedy, despair, and even uh, anger, frustration. It's all there in the music and all presented with the most brilliant technique, compositional technique as well. He had, it, he had it all, mind and heart. 
a few of us have played in full-time string quartets before, and um, we just decided we wanted to do this project about five years ago. Beethoven is incredibly relevant to us now. It's, 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 it's timeless music, it's beautiful music, and it touches people of all different ages and of all different times. Beethoven moves people in ways that every kind of music moves people. Music is just universal. to rehearse with colleagues whose uh, artistry and opinions you respect so highly as I do my colleagues is a great pleasure. It brings you to a better level yourself and uh, at least for me there's nothing more satisfying after all these decades of playing than to get better and to play more beautifully and so Beethoven and Patty and Mimi and Melissa all <laughs> inspire and drive that process. I feel so fortunate to be able to play this wonderful music. It's so, it's so delightful and so life-affirming. That story was brought to you by WXXI Television's Arts and Focus program. You can learn more about arts and culture in the Rochester region at wxxi.org slash arts and focus. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me and thank you for supporting news programming here on WXXI TV. I'll see you next week.